Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, you know, it's always good when someone actually reads your bio. Uh, first off, I would like to congratulate uh, you on putting on a fantastic conference and just look at this. This is your first one in the attendance. Uh, believe me, I put on a few and having this kind of attendance for your first one is something very special. So congratulations. So before we get started today, how many of you have ever seen me present? Oh my goodness, I'm becoming popular. Um, so bear with me because we got to get a little energy going and uh, you know you guys have just finished lunch so and also I, I need a little warmth from and love from all of you. So if I can just get you at all, all stand up a second for me. And just start stomping your feet. This I know you've seen it before but it's just so good. Okay just start stomping your feet nice and firmly. Start clapping your hands, move them here, a little, little harder, a little harder, a little harder. Okay, now you can sit down. I just wanted, normally I would take that as a stand innovation for myself and thank you very much. But today I actually would like that standing ovation to go to Bob and his team for putting this together. So. Uh, Oh, if that's all I have to do to get claps, this is going to be a cinch. All right, so as we go through today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to simply set the stage for you. Um, and that is, this session is not about you. This session is about your customers. A lot of times we make decisions based on what we like. All I'm here to do today is to present facts to you. What you do with those facts is all up to you. But I'd like you to keep in your mind, if you haven't, and I'm sure you do, but just wanted to remind you that this is all about your customers and your potential customers and what they are looking for and not what you want them to look for sometimes. Sometimes, as we were saying earlier, you do have to drag your customers along. But in general, let's set the stage for this. So the question to start the day is, if you were given an additional 30 years of life, how would you want to live it? The answer to this question may very well dictate the kind of facility and services that are derived from this session and that you develop over a period of time in conjunction with your customers. So anyone, what kind of life would you want? An additional 30 years of life right now. Darlene, what would you add to your life? Home base, family oriented. Anyone else? Uh, go, back to college. go back to college. I heard another one back there. Yeah. Travel. Oh my goodness. Any healthy. healthy? Oh, this is fun. Let's speed it up. Anyone else? Humor. Okay. humor. Oh, why would you want that? That's a little humor, by the way. Bad humor, but it's still humor. Anyone else? And companionship. companionship. So think about the things that you would like to do over the next 30 years and we're adding 30 years of additional life. Well that is exactly what has been happening over the last little while and continues to happen. And that is we are actually in the process of reinventing the life course. Now as we reinvent the life course, which is our course of life of course, uh, you know the question becomes is how do we address these changes that are going on? How do we address the changes of people who want to travel and do all these kinds of different things? So let's take a moment to step back and look at what the life course used to be, where it's going, and then how it actually applies to you. This is a bit, whoa, this is a, that's the scariest thing when you're publicly speaking. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, so, Here's basically the life course over the last, uh, you know, uh, 100 plus years. And that is, used to be you were born, well it still is that you're born actually, um, you know, that we learned, we worked, and then we retired. Matter of fact, for many, this still is the case. However, due to a little thing known as the longevity revolution, which took us from 47 years of age of average life expectancy to adding an additional 30 years plus, this is what a woman's life course looks like today. 
a little bit of a change. As you can see, we learn, we work, uh, you know, we have children, we're working, we're caring, retiring, okay? A certain amount of that also happened before, of course. Now, what has also been happening, of course, is that to address this, we're actually in the middle of a quality of life revolution. We see it where, uh, you know, our new Affordable Care Act and accountable care organizations and all of these things that are coming into place to help us actually live a more quality life because we're living longer. And because of that, today, our wealth actually is our health. 46% of us who actually retire early do so because of ill health. So that impacts our pocketbooks, that impacts our lifestyle, that impacts everything. But with that said, our life course is changing as well as the way that we're thinking about aging itself. According to uh, AARP report, 85% of the population, 40 to 90, no longer see themselves as old. Now, there's perception and reality, okay? But when you think about this, you need to take that into consideration of how you create your programs and also what you're addressing over the course of that life course. So with that said, you know, this is one of my favorite pictures and the reason is simple. It's about potential. So if we're no longer thinking of ourselves, oh, we're going to see a lot more of this. And this is Fajut Singh. He, uh, he ran the 100 yard meter, or 100 yard meters, yes. He ran the, the marathon at the age of 100 in Toronto, Canada. Uh, at that time, basically, the Director General for the World Health Organization came out and said, you know, if a man can run a, a, a marathon at the age of 100, maybe it's time we start changing the way we're thinking about aging. And this is a little slow here. So what is actually happening is that we're seeing a complete change in perceptions where it's not about age. And there's now a new saying, at least I'm creating a new saying, and it's called age be damned. It's not about age, it's about our abilities. It's being driven by research, it's being driven by the media, and it's also dr being driven by people 50 plus. All of the things you just talked about have nothing to do with age. Talk about your desire and your abilities to fulfill that. So today, we start seeing individuals such as this appearing. And they always have, but we see many more. You know, this is from New York Times. This uh, lady here is all tattooed up. How many times have you seen that in the past 50 years in the New York Times? Not many, okay? Part of the reason is, they're now reflecting the changes in our attitudes. So the question moving forward is, how do we help meet the changes in our life course that are occurring to achieve our aspirations, our expectations, our wants, needs, and capabilities? Now, this is projected by um, Ale uh, Alex Kalesh, uh, who used to be with the World Health Organization, of what the actual life course will look like in the future. So as you were planning your center and planning the services that you offer, look at all the different types. When do I work? When do I care? Do I take a sabbatical? Do I continue working? Do I have a gradated or uh, tapered off um, you know, work schedule as I grow older? All these things are things that we've been talking about, but these are actually happening now. Why? Because of the gift of 30 additional years and people want to live it the way they want to live it. So what has happened is that this is actually creating a demand by the World Health Organization, by the World Economic Forum, uh, by the World Bank, and many other organizations all focusing on change. Our current models are not meeting the needs and the shifts that are taking place. So if they're looking at, we need to change all these other things, why would we, in this industry, not need to change as well? The world is changing. Anyone remember Blockbuster? Okay. Someone forgot to tell them about digital. They didn't change. So, 
you know, hopefully within this group, we embrace that change and move forward. So, here, here's what's driving all of this change as well. Over the last 30 plus years, we have seen a lot more research taking place. Matter of fact, you can't even pick up a newspaper today. A newspaper? Ooh, speaking about change. A magazine, uh, you know, YouTube, uh, or any of these different things to learn about the latest research that has been happening. It, the older population has been researched, researched, and researched. And one thing that we have found, no matter what you look at, is that we have this unrealized potential. Fajut Singh was an example of that, but he's just one person. By the way, you may be thinking, no one's gonna run a marathon at the age of 100. Okay? He picked up running marathons and picked up running period after a 47-year layoff at the age of 77. Okay. So if you are not addressing those kinds of shifts and aspirations, mm, you know, you're missing a segment of the market moving forward. So the question becomes is what kind of senior center and environments would provide today's older adults with the kind of environment to help them achieve their potential? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And behind that are nine principles of active aging. And I'll tell you why I use active aging, because really active aging now is a policy framework globally that is actually addressing, it's not about physical activity, it's about being engaged in life. So with that said, um, you know, think beyond fitness. Let me just do that, because this is a little bit slow. Okay, so active aging is really about being fully engaged in life. So if we're reinventing the life course, how do we help individuals to become fully engaged in life during that life course? Anyone want to not be engaged in life? You can be socially isolated, that's okay. But most people want to be engaged, and active aging enables you to do that. And at the heart of active aging is the wellness model, which we will talk about in a little while. So uh, why active aging? Because active aging actually can impact many of the different challenges that we have today around aging. And if we address those challenges, we can actually fulfill our vision of our life course. It also enables us to take advantage of many of the different opportunities to help us to fill our potential as well. So with that said, let's get started. I'll just strip off a little bit here. For some reason, normally I get a woo, but maybe that's an aging thing. Okay, so first is populations. I'm not talking about population. Yes, there's 810 million people around the world that are over the age of 65, and we talk about old people, we talk about numbers and everything else. But I'm not talking about that. What I'm, oh, you can't even see that. Um, what I'm talking about is the diversity of the population. Okay? When we speak about the older population, a lot of times we want to put everyone in one box. We want to market to everyone the same way, and maybe you don't, which is absolutely fantastic and wonderful. But these are just some of the things that make this market diverse. Number one is there are now four generations. Anyone in here? Gen X? Hands up. Welcome to the club. Okay. Gen X now turns 50 this year, baby boomers. By the way, why do we keep calling them babies? They're about to turn 70, okay? Think about that. Baby boomers, oh, slap me, um, you know, are about to turn 70. And we have the silent generation, the GI generation. So we have multiple generations. So providing one-size-fits-all solutions becomes virtually impossible. We look at the aging process. We look at their functional abilities, health status, uh, lifestyle and experiences, aspiration and attitudes, race, income. There's so many different things that come into play. But yet society still wants to say everybody's old. It's different for each of us. Take a look at the person next to you for a moment. That's okay. You don't have to look in their eyes. You don't have to feel, you don't have to pe feel really uh, kind of a little bit off. Now, let me ask you, is that person your twin? 
Oh, come on, let's hear it. Yes, somebody said yes. All right. If they are, bring them on up. Um, the reality is we're not alike. So why would we keep doing everything alike? Personalization becomes more and more crucial as we move forward, and I'll explain that as we go through today. Um, so here's research that just came out in the, in the uh, about a week two, three weeks ago, uh, that scientists basically said, and we've known this for a long time, uh, that we all age differently. Have you seen someone that looks 70 that looks like they, we think what 50 should look like, and someone that's 50 that looks like 70 or acts like 70? And part of the reason is because the variability in the way we age is significant. Everything from 18 different physiological markers uh, like liver function to heart health uh, and you go on. So once again the diversity, we're aging differently, our programs need to be different, uh, but it's also about our functional abilities. In between the ages of 35 and 70 we lose about 50 percent of our strength and 75% of our power. When we're younger, we're invincible. Does anyone remember that time? You know, you'd be jumping out of a second story building with some girl's boyfriend chasing you. No problem! <laughs> no one's ever done that, right? No. Uh, today, you'd probably, you know, break a leg or something. Uh, in some instances. So what ends up happening is that we build our foundation, we achieve this feeling of invincibility, and then around midlife we tend to begin to lose our strength, we begin to lose some of our abilities, a lot of it is lifestyle oriented, inactivity, and then uh, as we go down this is what ends up happening and this is why we see at the age of 80 only 46% of people can lift a bowling ball. That's 10 pounds. The question is what impact does not being able to lift that bowling ball have on someone's quality of life? The exciting part is it doesn't have to be that way and that's why facilities like this have beautiful fitness rooms now. It's not about fitness, it's about helping someone to maintain their abilities to live their life, to fulfill their potential. Um, it, I'm going to give you an example. I wasn't going to do it because I figured most of you have probably seen it, but for those of you that haven't, can I, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, what's your name, sir? Juan. 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 How much do you weigh? 200 pounds. Come on up. Come on up, Juan. Don't be shy. Juan, uh, come on, run. Run. You're supposed to be running. Colin. I'm not that excited about this. Oh, you've seen it before, have you? No? Oh, Juan. Don't be shy. All right. Let's give Juan a hand. One's about to find out what he's in for. Okay, so you remember when you were a kid you used to do leapfrogs? Sure. Well, that's not what we're doing. Good. Okay, but close to it. All right. So what I'd like you to do is just jump up onto my back. Okay. Is there a waiver? Is there a waiver? No, the waiver is on me. <laughs> okay, what you got to do is just make sure that you grab around my neck. Okay, your legs, no big deal. If they drag all over the place, that's okay. Okay. Okay, so, okay, you may want to... What would you like? <laughs> okay. So, think about this. Right now, one actually is about... Put that phone down. That's right. <laughs> okay. So, think about this. One is about how much I weigh. So, as I walk around the stage here and speak to you, Juan is beginning to make me sweat. Uh, that's two of us, actually. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not doing much. And it's always good when someone is actually riding you and, uh, you know, <laughs> and they start speaking, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, now imagine if I have to run with Juan on me to catch a bus or climb stairs or play with my grandkids. Do you think it's going to impact my quality of life? Oh. Well, let's give Juan a hand. Thanks, Thanks Juan. Sir. So, I have been doing that for 
many years because I can't find anything else that this, uh, gets across the message of how you lose or what the impact is of losing 50% of your strength. Juan, you just demonstrated what happens when I lose 50% of my strength. Helping people to restore that becomes crucial to their quality of life. Okay? But also, we lose 75% of our power, which actually also impacts our ability to react in the process of falling. So, the question becomes is, how do we help each of these individuals ensure that they maintain their functional ability? Five different levels of function. We have the older athlete. This person will come in, do whatever they want, whether your facility is open or not, sometimes. Um, fit individual, they've been actually exercising two to three times a week uh, and have been doing it for years, many of them. Some may have just picked it up. Uh, an independent individual, which is most of the population. They're looking to improve their physical fitness to be able to function the way they would like. Is that a fire alarm? <laughs> no. Uh, frail, in many instances, you can basically reverse the, uh, you know, the loss of things like strength and so forth. Not always, because it's not always that. And dependence, where I'm actually now in a wheelchair or I'm in bed. You can move along the continuum this way or along the continuum that way, just simply by providing some very basic physical activity programs to improve function. You hear all these different recommendations and so forth, and it scares the hell out of some people when you speak to them about fitness, exercise, they're gonna sweat. Uh, on the other hand, no one wants to lose their functional abilities or independence. And it's actually not just about the physical, it's, always, it's also about the cognitive function, it's about the social function. You can have a high functioning individual uh, physically who is challenged cognitively uh, and who may be socially isolated. They like going out and they like to run, but they're beginning to lose their memory uh, and they don't like to come into your center. So how do you actually connect with each and every one of these individuals and help to improve that, those various functional levels? That's what it's about. It's not just about getting strong and getting uh, you know, your cardiovascular exercise in for the sake of doing that. This is what it's all about. Why function? Because it actually impacts uh, everything from our cost to falls management to independence, ability to work, uh, loss of function. Remember what I said earlier, 46% of the population that uh, retired early before the age of 65 did so because of ill health. I'll bet you a large portion of that is loss of function. And to me, the biggest loss with functional loss is loss of potential. Our loss to live the life we want to live, especially now that we have this opportunity in front of us and we're redefining uh, the life course. So with that said, you know, the other parts of diversity are health. You know, 65 per, we all know that 65% of the population have various health conditions. The thing is that each of those health conditions acts individually for each individual. So a lot of times we put everybody in uh, a heart, uh, heart health or a arthritic program or what have you, but you gotta remember each of these things act individually. So how do you actually uh, customize your programming around function and around the individuality of these health issues? You know, gone are the day of one size fits all programming, which is really what in many instances we've done in the past, or we don't even do programming. We just have a room. And we say, have at her. I walk in and I go, have you ever walked into somewhere that it, everything's beautiful and it's shiny and you have no idea what the hell to do with it? That's what happens. I walk through the door and I go, wow. That occurs many times. Stand at the front of the door and see what happens. So a thought to ponder as we move forward is, is the lack of diversity in you're addressing the diversity of the population itself impacting your results. And after all, it's all about results. We need to get people in, we need to help keep them healthier. So number two, uh, perceptions. 
This is standard perceptions of aging. We've talked about it for years. Burden, super senior, you know, flying, you know, Earl, uh, what, was, what was the um, guy that used to come in and the, forget it. It's one of those moments where you just can't remember what you were about to say. You know, anti-aging, aging is a disease or invisibility, okay? You know, the, yeah, the super senior, you know, they would be doing something absolutely crazy. Question is, are they a super senior or just simply someone actually achieving their potential? Two different ways of looking at it. However, our perceptions today are changing. All we have to do is to look at the way some older adults are dressing today. The way they're acting, the way, I shouldn't say they, because it's us, okay? Now, with that said, I'm going to show you a little video that actually is setting out to try and change that. But this is just one of many different aspects. Yeah. Oh, is it working? Nope. Okay. Well, I'll tell you about this video. So this video is actually from uh, Coca-Cola. And what it does is it has this uh, lady who walks up and, you know, you look at her and you think, geez, she's, she's my grandmother. And she comes out of a car, she meets her grandkids, and then she jumps into the back of a plane. And she goes up, she's 86 years of age, and she jumps out of the plane. Now, is that a super senior? Well, she's been doing it all of her life and she has 866 jumps. So I would say, you know, one of the things, things we need to look at moving forward is how do we help an individual like this continue to fulfill her aspirations instead of saying, in many instances, as she would in some places, walk in and go, oh no, you couldn't do that, you're too old. This is changing, and changing quite rapidly over the last uh, few years. So what we're seeing today is a new reality. And it's, it's moving fast, except for it's not in the marketing world yet. So the question becomes, is what can you do within your organization to change perceptions because perceptions become reality reality become new or perceptions become reality changing the old ones and creating a new reality here's what's occurring actually in the fashion industry how many of you remember that it was like year old you can't wear that you ever heard that my daughters tell me that all the time <laughs> and all that i wear is a pair of shorts and a shirt. Maybe it's because the shorts are up to here, but no. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why they're saying it. But what's happening, interestingly, in the fashion industry right now is that Helen Mirren, Joni Mitchell, um, Catherine Deneuve, uh, all of them, whether it is a moment, a blip in time, or whether it is a change taking place, many of the youth-oriented organizations are embracing older models. Okay. We're seeing that all over the place. Angelica Houston. Uh, all you have to do is Google older models in fashion industry and it's amazing what is actually taking place. Or here is a group of uh, older adults actually that are starring in a calendar from Germany about uh, the different movies that have actually occurred. Why? Because they can. And it's actually trying to help change perceptions in their community. Uh, this is a project called Wrinkle in the City. It's, be, it's been done in different uh, countries around the world. Part of the goal is just simply to bring older adults into the city. This is the infrastructure. Uh, it's painted on walls. Why? Invisible, make people visible. Or older athletes. This gentleman is 91 years of age. He's still playing hockey. Now, I don't know about you, but hockey is a physical sport. Okay? It would be great to see two teams of 91-year-olds going at it and just seeing how physical it is. But the reason I bring this up is if you're beginning to see more and more older athletes, we're also beginning to see more and more older athlete spokespeople. Why? Because you're speaking to me. 
okay? Look at Hollywood. How many movies are now coming out with older adults in the movies? Change is happening, but it's interesting that change is happening within the fashion industry and within Hollywood. Are we actually changing as well? They would be two of the last industries I would ever anticipate to change. So a thought to ponder is what impact does positive or negative visions of aging have in your business? And how can you change that? Number three, people. Here's our challenge moving forward. People. How many of you have a challenge finding staff? Not only finding staff, paying for staff, okay? Big issue, okay? But we find whether it's therapeutic recreation, uh, whether it's geriatricians, no matter, no matter the field, um, you know, except for investors now, uh, we're finding fewer and fewer people in the field of aging. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're expected to draw an additional um, 1.6 million more people in the field of direct care, but yet we don't have enough right now. Where are they all going to come from? Well, one of the areas that's going to help bridge this gap is technology. This is an image from a Dutch retirement community. I'm not so sure if this is the future, but I used it just simply to display what is occurring, and that is a little robot up there giving them their aerobic class. Okay, now, if you don't have a staff, you can get bigger robots nowadays, you know, in your, uh, give me one more, one more, one more, okay? <laughs> Is that gonna be, a matter of fact, if you know anything, you'll know I was doing it the wrong way, so one more, <laughs> okay? But the rise of robots, okay? It's already out there, cutting our lawn, cleaning our pools. Anyone have an Apple phone? That little thing in the middle, Siri, that's a robot. The automated car that's coming out, and it is, you can get automated braking now, all of these things, those are robots, okay? So whether we like it or not, this is occurring. The question is, what do we do about it? Taking a completely opposite approach is Japan, where they are actually incentivizing their citizens to connect with each other. Why? Because they don't have enough caregivers. And with their immigration policies, it makes it tougher for them. So what they've done is they've incentivized uh, their population to connect with each other so that 80% of the population will be connected within the next few years. How? You're out in the middle of the park doing your Tai Chi every morning. I know all of you do that, right? Uh, and at the end of your workout, you go, you introduce yourself to someone else, and you get a little stamp for making those connections. And then once you've actually got enough stamps, you get food. Now, why are they doing that? Because the philosophy is that you, my neighbor, will help me if I'm in need. I don't have a caregiver, so I actually have you, and we're connecting. That's their goal. How it will work, we will have to see. Um, but question is, what do we do about people? What is the curriculum that we need to actually create today around the changes that are occurring? It's certainly not the same curriculum that we have used all this time. Why? Because things are changing. And then we just simply need to address change. And one of the ways we need to address change is within our programs. So, remember we talked about diversity. And that you can literally turn the dial this way or this way, depending on what we actually do for our functional levels. But, as I mentioned earlier, baby boomers are looking for customization. So, what are you gonna do to customize your facilities and your services? Remember, it's about me. It's not about you. It's about me. What are you gonna do for me? I want to come in, I want to get healthy. I want to come in, I want to do... Remember, I want to come in. So what are you going to do to help me bridge that gap and actually come in and embrace your services? That is one of our challenges moving forward, is embracing the service. By the way, it's so wonderful to hold this uh, conference in such an amazing facility, isn't it? Uh, to me, this is a great best practice, and congratulations, Bob. 
Here's one of the ways to help people actually from a programmatic standpoint and also to meet their life uh, aspirations and that is to incorporate a model that is based around wellness. Now wellness, we've been talking about this for a long, 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 long time. But still, many organizations haven't embraced this. This is a two trillion dollar opportunity for those of you that are actually looking for services that you can charge to the community. Whether it is creating an environment that brings people back or the environment outside, uh, challenging someone intellectually. Um, by the way, how many of you get stimulated each and every day when you go somewhere? Think about it. What stimulates you? What excites you intellectually about places you go? The physical aspect. We can talk about that all day long. To me, that's part of... Let's, let's do a little demonstration. Can I get you to all stand for a minute, please? See, I had to speed up my walking. Okay. Now, if you can just sit down. Oh, come on. Not slowly. We're going to go a little quicker. Sit down. Stand up. Sit down, stand up. See, Jim's smart, he just stands. Sit down, <laughs> stand up. Okay, a little faster, sit down, stand up. Sit down, stand up. How many of you begin? I see some huffing going on, okay, that's fine. Okay, the only person that's supposed to sweat is me, so, okay. So, here's the issue. If I can't do that, I can't stand up, I can't get out of bed, can't get out of chair, I have a problem, don't I? So, you can address that through functional health, okay? Um, social, social connections. By the year 2020, the second leading cause of premature death and disability will be depression, according to the World Health Organization. How are you trying to keep people socially connected? As that is one way of helping to stave off that issue. Okay, uh, the spiritual aspect, in the moment program. These are all basics, but we're still, in many instances, not doing them. Uh, you know, the vocational, helping people to reskill. How many of you have to work later on in life? Many of us. Don't be shy, most of us do. Healthcare, rising cost of healthcare, all the dot coms, all these different things that went bust. Uh, you know, stock market, all of that. Helping people to reskill for a new way of life. The emotional aspect. Well, remember we just talked about depression. What can you do to help offset that? Help people to lead balanced lifestyles uh, with balanced lifestyle programming. But incorporating a wellness model not only addresses the, the diversity of your uh, potential customer, it also opens up a wide variety of potential income streams for you. And I know that in the past, many of us have stayed away from income streams. Some maybe know. Uh, but we need to look at how we add some of these. And the baby boomers are paying for this. Question is whether they're paying for it with you or someone else. By the way, you have a great environment because a lot of baby boomers are not turned on by health clubs even though they've been in them. I mean, you know, can you imagine? <laughs> Ooh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Ooh, look at that. You know, that's about what many health clubs are. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I made my living for many, many years in that. But, um, you know, the reality is we're looking for different environments, okay? And you have the opportunity to provide that. As I mentioned, it's a $2 trillion opportunity for those of you that are being challenged from a funding standpoint, look beyond the four square walls. And you don't have to actually just do it within your facilities. You know, taking wellness out to the community is a wonderful opportunity. There's also another opportunity from a programmatic standpoint that falls under wellness. And I think Billy Graham said it best, and that is the best way to plan for, uh, you know, the challenges of old age is to prepare well ahead of time. Challenge is many of us have not. And that's why we see the health issues. That's why we see financial issues. That's why we see all of these different issues, which then 
which by the way, 86% of us say, no problem, we're prepared. The question is, is that reality? Or is it an underestimation when you actually look at the final statistics uh, as far as where we are today? So, here's one opportunity. Helping people to manage change for quality of life. Adapt. We need to adapt. Um, there's a lot that is occurring. First change is a lot of people actually struggle with getting older. We all know that. How many of you just love the process of getting older? Why not? It's rewarding. On the other hand, you know, it's kind of tough to think of yourself as old when your kids come up and go, you got old hands. And I remember saying the exact same thing to my dad many years ago when I looked at his hands and I thought, ooh, he's just got old. There was a day, what was it, the day before that he was young and now his hands are old? No. But it's funny how different things happen. I digress for a moment there. So these are some wonderful opportunities to help people manage a change. Life coaches, do you have them? If you don't, why not? If you do, what are you doing with them? It's easy to say I have a life coach. The question is, what are you actually doing as a life coach? I'll show you in a minute. You know, uh, concierge services, do you have them or do you not? Does that just become an online concierge where you actually don't need a physical person but you have a service that you can contract that will actually connect your uh, customers with what they're looking for? What's next? Helping people to figure out what's next. Age management. You know, we all need help. Okay? Longevity clinics popping up all over the country. Learn what these organizations are doing and see whether you could apply some of this to what you're doing. Not all of it's going to apply. You know, the best thing to do is always take the best of what you think could apply to what you're doing and change it to what you do, as opposed to say, oh, a longevity clinic, that's not me. Maybe 90% of it may not be, but 10% could be. Learn what they're doing and why they're being successful in this space. Here's just a few things that change as we get older. Our independence changes in some instances. Our physical abilities change in some instances. Our hair changes in some instances. I actually was working out with a lady friend of mine the other day. That sounds so kind of, hmm, a lady friend. Anyway, I was working out with a female friend the other day. And, um, you know, she said, you know, you were lucky. I know. And I said, hmm. But why? She said, you still have your hair. The age of 54. And I was going, oh, that's an issue, I guess. You know, now you see all the uh, more and more services that are coming up. Um, you know, so helping people to, you know, uh, work with their vision. There's a new discovery that came out uh, from the University of British Columbia, where I'm from. Uh, and they actually have a little... Um, it's almost like a contact that they can put into your eye that will actually change your eyesight to 2020 or better. They're working on humans now. They were just doing it with animals. It was all over the news a few uh, months ago. You know, but all of these things are coming out, helping people to figure out how to change to retirement, moving from not working to, or working to not working to not working. Uh, time, changes in time, managing their time. These are all different areas, and there's so many different areas. So is that an opportunity for you to actually assist people in helping them to manage their life changes, and helping them to become more resilient and adapt? We all need help. Even the best athlete actually has a coach, even though they may not want one. Now. One change is just simply, I'm not speaking about Alzheimer's or dementia, I'm just simply speaking about staying sharp. Any of you uh, remember where, you're, where you put, or let me rephrase that. Do any of you not know where you put your keys? Do any of you not know where your kids are? No. <laughs> That's a different thing, they're out partying. Um, this came out a few weeks ago, 75 minutes of physical activity can help you stay sharper cognitively. Now, 
Most of us, if we're going to continue working, need to remain sharp. If you're going to continue to hold a conversation, it's good to stay sharp. There are many reasons why you want to stay. Take care of your finances. Just simply moving 75 minutes a week. They tested 150 minutes and, and beyond and found very little difference. Just simply doing this, 75 minutes, just walking around. I know how exciting this is for you. Just doing this, you get a little dizzy actually. Um, per week. 75 minutes per week. That's it. Physical activity. It, now that's just keeping yourself sharp. That's not eliminating Alzheimer's. That's not eliminating dementia or any of these things that people are actually touting out there. That's just simply staying alert and sharp. Okay. Now, could you promote that and actually have people coming in because of that? Absolutely. Or, you know, what could you do to make your intergenerational programmings more inspirational and aspirational? Just because I want to connect in, uh, intergenerationally doesn't mean I want to volunteer. It doesn't mean that I want to mentor. I may want to go traveling and travel as a group with a younger group. Okay? Find out what people's aspirations are. How many of you have an aspiration finder? When I come into your community or your center at the start, do you actually find out what people's aspirations are? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? How can we help you get there? What kind of services would you like available to you? Now, physical activity has been on the rise and actually it is one of the key components for helping us to achieve this. Uh, over, I just wrote a paper for um, the 2016 Gerontology and uh, Geriatric Review and one of the uh, findings that I had was that we've increased physical activity amongst older adults 116% between 1998 and 2012. Yeah, that's about what I thought, actually. And here's the issue. We moved from 5.5% to 11.9%. We're still way below where we need to be. This is people meeting the physical activity guidelines of 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise a week, doing uh, strength training once or twice a week, uh, doing balance training, flexibility, and some power training. Okay? Small. Huge increase, small number. The exciting part of all of this, by the way, did you hear about the Surgeon General's report on uh, walking? They uh, did a walk yesterday on the mall, or at least they were scheduled to do that. Well, it's very exciting because 50% of individuals, 65 plus, actually it's over 50%, 45 plus, 55 plus, 65 plus, and so forth, 50% are actually meeting the physical activity guidelines for cardiovascular health, probably most walking, okay? So we know that the cardio portion, one out of two people are meeting, the rest of it, not so much. So our goal has got to be, yes, the uh, Surgeon General's report has come out and we know the importance of walking, but we've got pretty good penetration right now around walking. We need to help people become strong so that they can actually stand to walk. Okay. Uh, the uh, NCOA stats, 82% of older adults say that exercising, uh, they're exercising at least once a week, up 75 uh, from 75% uh, or up from 72% to 75%. Now, the question becomes is how do we take that 50% and that 82% and take those once a week people and move them into those three times a week or more people? That's our challenge is we have 32%, they're different studies, but let's say we have 32% of people who are actually what I would call low hanging fruit. What do we need to do to move those people into the range of meeting the physical activity guidelines? You know, part of it is actually being relevant to them. 
uh, instead of talking about what exercise does for you in the future, talking about how you can gain more energy today, less stress today. You can play with your grandkids, uh, you know, uh, today and be more energized, uh, more engaged, happier. Focus on what people can do today as opposed to what they're actually going to do in the future. Robert. If you exercise, I promise you that you will improve your heart health for the future. Good job, buddy. Robert, you want to have some energy? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Big difference, okay? But that's a reality. This is my friend uh, Richard Durwall with the city of uh, Buffalo, or he works at one of the senior centers in Buffalo. He sent this to me. Uh, feel better tomorrow. Call me and you'll feel better tomorrow. That's him with two of his uh, clients right there. He's a trip. Anyone know Richard? Oh, he's a blast. Oh, Richard is a blast. 93 jumps rope every day. She's on YouTube. You know what? YouTube is changing a lot of things. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little while. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Products. You can't see it. 94% of baby... Uh, I'm going to just slap myself. Every time I say baby, just go boomers. Baby? Boomers. Oh, you guys catch on really quick. Bob, you were right. Um... 94% are interested in trying new things. For all these years, we've been told, older people don't try new things. Older people don't want new experiences. What a crock. Okay. My mom and dad, Facebook, Apple phone. Those are just two new things. Okay. Why? It's just being part of the culture nowadays. Okay. Yes. There are some things that we may be more resistant to, who we socialize with. Um, what alcohol is effective. Anyway, yes, you caught that one. 72% mm. uh, are open to trying uh, new brands. We talk about that they're, you've got me and you've got me for life. Not so. If you give me awful service, why would I come to you? Why would I come to you? And 78% agree that media advertising should recognize them more than they actually do. Um, so, here's our challenge, is that evidence shows that there is a lack of products and services that are catering to the older population, okay? Now, that really is no new news. The thing is, we have to, as a group, convince our suppliers to actually make their products more inclusive as opposed to exclusive. You know, a lot of the fitness products out on the market today are certainly not developed with the older adult in mind. A lot of the new fitness trends are not developed with older adults in mind. Uh, you know, mud racing, uh, you know, all of this. <laughs> If someone's laughing in the back of you, done it? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of these extremes are not uh, developed with most of the population in mind. Here's some of the things that you want to keep in mind, and that is the boomers dominate when it comes to purchasing, uh, you know, packaged good products. So why not actually cater to them? The products that you bring in, make sure that your supplier, ask them how it actually applies to your market. I know that those are basic things. This is actually a product that is designed to vibrate. This, this hasn't, I don't think it's hit the market yet, but you know, this is an example. This product is designed to vibrate so it tells you if you're a little bit off balance so that you can adjust and not f try and minimize falls. That applies young, old, it doesn't matter, okay? Building inclusive products is really what it's about. Technology, we are assessing people up to the yin-yang nowadays, okay? Wristwatch, it's no longer a watch, we know that, okay? It can tell me where I'm going. Matter of fact, you can track me where I'm going. Um, you know, if I have dementia, you can track me. If, uh, you know, um, I want to find a restaurant, I can. If I want to you know, check my oxygen, 
levels, my dehydration levels. Uh, you know, I can get an Under Armour shirt that will help me do that. You know, we are assessing people, I think, almost too much. What do people need to know is the question. What do you need to know if you are creating services for them? Telehealth, telewellness, yes, those are things that are coming. The question is, how crucial do they become? Uh, helping people to integrate and understand uh, you know, technology for new skills. We've talked about that for a long time, but I would approach it from a workforce standpoint. We speak about robotics. They now have robots that will actually go from office to office, so you don't have to get up. And actually, you can have uh, uh, like Skype calls with people. Our goal is to get people up. That's why I keep asking you to get up. Don't sit. Sitting. What? Oh, stop the insanity years ago. You remember that lady? So this is a new one. Sitting kills! You remember her? She did stop the insanity. Oh, okay. I was just checking that you're awake. Okay, promotions. Ah. Older adults are virtually invisible in marketing. This is not me saying this. 95% of worldwide marketing are targeted to people below the age of 50. In the US, that same number is people below the age of 35. Now it is changing. It is changing. Slowly, but it is changing. We're moving from mostly drugs, travel, insurance to now more aspirational elements. Our challenge, though, is we, man, I got to tell you, all you have to do is look at some of those numbers. I'm going to give Bob the slides that he can give to you. You can do with them what you want. Take them home, use them. But, you know, when you look at the statistics, 46% often don't feel that advertising and marketers are focused. On, I mean, it's, it's all about what they don't feel. Okay? Uh, three out of four people feel dissatisfied with marketing that is targeting them. What does this mean? Can anyone tell me what these negative numbers mean? Lost business, huge opportunity. Huge opportunity because if we're doing it wrong in many instances or it's not resonating with our customers, we have the opportunity to change that because most people aren't. So if we can actually become more effective in our marketing, not saying you're not, I know many of you probably are, but some of us maybe could do a little bit better, okay? Uh, you know, 50% fine advertising that is obviously targeting them to be patronizing and stereotypical. Okay, what do you do? You make sure that your advertising is not patronizing and stereotypical. It's not very hard. Okay? So, I look at statistics and I say, what does this actually mean and how do I do the opposite sometimes to actually achieve success? Okay? Here's a brand. I use this a, as an example because I think they have done an amazing job of rebranding themselves, okay? Insure. Remember Insure used to be in just hospitals? It was nasty. It was nasty, okay? Um, I shouldn't say that, but it was. Um, now, 80% of baby boomers believe that food is actually the pathway to better health and uh, actually, you see products like Insure now coming out, muscle health, uh, bone health, and they're on the uh, shelves of your major drugstores, your uh, Vons, places like that, depending where you are in the country. Why? Because there's a market. They've rebranded it. When they first came out, they had no one. They used the little character, caricature, certain words like aluminum, just don't go. Um, but they have done an amazing job of rebranding themselves to be inclusive as opposed to exclusive. Still with a target towards the older population, but much more inclusive than what they used to be. Okay? Hot Wheels. I always have to show this, I'm sorry, but this is, to me, this is the best ad out there. Well, it's not the best ad. It's one of what I think is uh, amazing ads targeted to the older population. And it's all about being real. And that is, it doesn't matter how old you are, you'll always find your Hot Wheels under the fridge, okay? 
doesn't have to say a word, does it? It just simply implies what is actually occurring. Irrelevant about your age. It's just simply said. Now, that might be a male thing, you know. Uh, and Barbie has turned 50, so I don't know, ladies, you know, if that was the gig. But, um, you know, the other aspect is, I, I, I don't know if this will work, but if it will, this is an ad that was shown. How many of you have seen this ad? Anyone seen this ad? Oh, this is so good. Let's see if it works. Nope, doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to tell you about this ad. This ad is, oh, it is. Maybe that's why I can't see it moving here. Okay, so you got your porn for the day. But anyway. Now, here are two things to uh, think about why this ad is so important. One is it's breaking perceptions that as you get older, you know, I mean, I remember hearing Ken Dykewall speak about his parents in their 50s, and he was repulsed back then when he was young about them having sex. I'm in my 50s. Come on, man. Okay, how many of you are in your 50s? How many of you really hate sex? <laughs> oh, don't put your hands up. I know that. <laughs> we can talk about that later. Um, anyway, but it's reality. Young, old, doesn't matter. We need to be concerned about, you know, safe sex. This ad was hugely popular. The other part about that is it also inspires you that you need to maintain your functional abilities. <laughs> Just remember, it's all about function. Anyway, places. The whole thing is changing. I mean, we know it, uh, and you know, I talk about it. Just look at this place, okay? The whole active aging movement is shifting the way we build environments from the outdoor environment to the indoor environment. Question is, are we responding? Now, remember what I was saying earlier, it's not about you, it's about your customers. If you haven't, go for a trip with them. Ask them, what do they like? What don't they like? Okay? I can tell you, baby boomers coming in have certain expectations. We have grown up with everything from Motel 6 to the St. Regis. And I can tell you, Motel 6 is okay if you have to, but somewhere in between is where I normally stay, okay? So, you know, looking at what kind of environments are actually being created. Here's an initiative that has been taking place. The Milken Institute um, has actually got 130 mayors across the country to sign on about helping to make their cities more and there's so many different terminologies now. They're focusing on successful aging. Okay? Now the question is, what does that actually mean? Okay? You also have age-friendly cities that are occurring all around the world. Okay? Dementia-friendly cities, dementia-friendly businesses, age-friendly business. The, the point is that change is happening. People are recognizing that what we have needs to change. It doesn't matter if you call it successful aging, if you call it age-friendly, whatever you want to call it, just do it. Ooh, somewhat branding. Anyway, um, as I mentioned, you know, I was just in the UK doing a present series of presentations over there. Over 60 towns and cities in the UK have already signed on for dementia-friendly cities. How to make cities more accessible for people with dementia, of course. Um, you know, here's an example of a, a group that is looking to build a health city, March Life Care Campus. Okay, very different than, you, they say city, maybe it's a few blocks. OK, 
okay? But their project is all around health and healthy aging and healthy lifestyles right across the board. You can tell by the way the project is developed that they're using a holistic approach. You can tell with the little hill at the top uh, and as you wind up there, um, you know, that they are using um, all that they can to make the outdoors come alive. But so can you. Doesn't have to be really fancy. It just simply needs to be. Little walkway. Okay, now what do you do with that walkway? How do you make it more compelling? You know, in Holland, as an example, now they have solar pathways. So actually, if you want to ride at night, you can actually ride and it's lit up. It's lit up because the pathway is driven by, you know, um, the solar energy. So, you know, what can you do to create outdoor environments that are geared to healthy aging, okay? Outdoor fitness trails. This is something that I've been to 33 different countries in the world now. Almost every single one of them have these. Along the inlet to coming into Istanbul, all along there. Chile, uh, it's Hong Kong. I was hiking up a mount uh, mountain, little park actually. Um, don't we have a habit of exaggerating? I was hiking up this mountain, all the way up. Um, and they had all these fitness parks all the, way th all the way through. So, but also, what is the environment, not just outdoors, indoors, but how is technology going to play into the environment? Are we going to have walls that people are literally touching, which you can do right now. All you have to do is go to an airport, you know, and touch the screens. It's not so much the adults that are doing that right now, it's the kids. Oh, look at that, Mom. Look at that, Dad. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm trying to look and see what is happening, and it's going crazy. But anyway, you know, but this is part of what our future looks like. Like it or not, it's already happening, and it's coming full force. So the question is sitting down with your clients and potential clients and asking them what kind of environments they want and then also looking at what are some best practices of environments. We don't always know what we want. That's part of the challenge. So a thought to ponder, and that is, you know, environments provide experiences good and bad. So a good environment keeps people coming back. A bad environment turns them off. Okay. Um, the last couple, and I think we're in time for what, 10? Oh. Oh, okay. Well, I will make this quick. There's not much here. Okay. So, policy. Globally, there's a lot of different policies happening right now in the field of aging. Great stuff. Doesn't matter. It all comes back to you. What are the policies in your facilities? You know, activity over the life course. We're now recognizing that aging is about... Uh, now. I don't know about you, but I've recognized since I was born that aging is actually something that happens throughout the whole thing. My dad's aging, my grandmother's aging, I'm aging, we're all aging. The question is, are we getting old? It's a big difference. Uh, integrated approaches, reallocating funds, accelerated responses, improving curriculums for uh, specialists in this area, supportive environments. These are just some of the policies internationally and nationally that are occurring out there. But at the end of the day, all of that is great, but it comes back to you. What is the policies in your facilities? How do you make things more accessible? How do you reduce the barriers to entry? Uh, you know, we have a habit of always wanting to send people to get a physical because they're older, as opposed to looking at are there pre-existing conditions, and that's the reason we send them, as opposed to, you know, Fajut Singh, who maybe comes in at uh, the age of 100, and you say, well, I'm going to send you for a physical. Oh, okay, I just did the marathon, but uh, I guess I could go. Um, then nine, last. Here's the opportunity for all of us, and that is one out of two people over the age of 50 that are adults in the U.S. That wasn't said well. So let me, let's try it again. Are you ready? Okay. One out of every two adults in the U.S. are over the age of 50. That's better. Thank you. Um, the question is, do you get them or don't you? Where are people going? Where do people actually go?
go. You know, movie theaters are still in existence. They were supposed to be closed up a long time ago. You know, so projections of where things go don't always happen the way they're supposed to. However, we can look at some numbers. Uh, the U.S. is 80%. In the U.K., it's 79% disposable wealth. This is a key figure. I'm not speaking about just in your bank accounts. This is disposable income. Yes, there are many people who are disenfranchised. There are many people who are uh, low income. Uh, there are many people who need help. There are also many people who can pay for your services. So you need to figure out, if you haven't already, I'm sure many of you have, but how do you segment that? How do you build different levels? You know, the YMCA does it very nicely where they offer scholarships to those who cannot afford it. And for those who can, you pay. It's really that simple. Um, but here's your customer in my mind. Ladies, you have the power. Okay? And men, like it or not, that's the truth. 80 to 90% of all decisions made in the family are made by women or influenced by women. Women account for three quarters of the nation's financial wealth and will inherit 70% of the $41 trillion passed on by our parents and also passed on by our spouses. Okay? So if you're a gigolo, look for an older woman. If you're not, look for them anyway. <laughs> okay? Now, my question for you is very simple, and that, that is, <laughs> are our facilities really catering to what women are looking for? I'm a man, and I can tell you that from a fitness facility, I'm not speaking about here now, I'm speaking about a different industry. Fitness facilities they have this opportunity and they're very masculine. So when you go back and you walk into your center, ask yourself, if I'm an older woman and I actually have some money, is this a place I want to be? And what would you need to change that? And I'm not speaking about filthy rich. I'm speaking about just simply some money that I can afford your services. So with that said, is your center catering to her aspirations? So today we talked about the nine principles of active aging and how they actually can help you redefine uh, aging and redefine your centers. The question is, what's now? I have no idea. It's all up to you. All I've done is help inform you on where the potential is. Now it's all up to you of what you do with it. So with that said, I'd like to thank you very much and encourage you to go out there and make change happen.